and welcome to another episode of Tech Policy Grind. This is Joseph Jerome, and in this episode, your trio of hosts are joined by Anisha Mangalik, Associate Corporate Counsel at Zendesk. We chat having a science background in law, and then I ask over and over again, what in the world is blockchain? Anisha and Emery try to get me to stop asking stupid questions about Bitcoin miners and trusted middlemen. Hope you enjoy the show. I really love where law and technology intersect. Um, and part of that is because basically the, the law can't really keep up with the way technology uh, improves and and the way that it changes so fast. And so when you're working in that space, it ends up being really a lot more of a creative problem solving exercise rather than kind of a check the box. OK, we're complying with the law. Uh you know, um, activities. So, so right. I, I really enjoy that. And I think it's really exciting, especially right now being here in San Francisco in, in the Bay area, kind of at the, at the, um, hub of, of this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So that, so you're, you're not originally from the Bay. So tell us a little bit about your journey and like where you grew up, where did you do undergrad? why did you choose law school? Um, you know, it's just, I'd like to hear about kind of where you worked before your current role, and also talk to us a little bit about Nestle SF. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I grew up in Minnesota, which uh, most Californians don't really know where that is. <laughs> you know, we know how to say Minnesota, though. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, were you a Vikings fan? Were you heartbroken this year? Oh, yeah. I would consider myself a fair weather Vikings fan. So when they're doing Isn't there well, fair weather in Minnesota, yeah. though? Oh, don't <laughs> don't get me start don't get me started on bandwagon fans. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm just you know gonna call it what it is. I'm definitely a fair weather fan. Uh, I was super excited when they were on the way to the Super Bowl, especially in our hometown, uh, and then they didn't make it. <laughs> um, but but it really it was a really cool place to grow up. Prince lived there. Um, yeah. You know, we have our ten thousand lakes. <laughs> So when they're not frozen, it's kind of cool to hang out there. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I grew up in Minnesota. I really enjoyed it. I stayed in the Midwest for undergrad. Um, and uh, so I went to, to University of Michigan, and, and I majored in brain behavior and cognitive science, which is kind of a combination of neuroscience and psychology. And uh, I just thought it was fascinating. I... I really like learning about human behavior, how the brain works. Um, and kind of in addition to that, I also minored in Spanish and, and I was really interested in like international and immigration issues. And, mm -hmm. um, and so kind of thinking about going forward from there, why I went to law school. So, um, you know, I mentioned, you know, this interest in, in human behavior and international issues. I also, as I had touched upon earlier, really love problem solving and, and the creative side of things, which I'll get into a little bit later. But these are kind of themes that have underlied my my career as I've pushed forward. And so when I went to law school, I actually thought I was going to be an immigration attorney. Well, can we back up a bit? And what was what was it like going doing the jump from uh, brain sciences to law school? That's a, a pretty big leap. Yeah, it is. Or was it uh, always in the yes, plans, I mean? <laughs> No, no. I, I decided to go to law school probably, I would say, like senior year of, of college. Um, but I, basically when I was when I was in undergrad, I, I focused a lot on like decision making and hmm. and kind of science behind that. And so uh, when I went to law school, there was, it was a lot of overlap and kind of transition between the logic piece of that and oh, yeah, and. Yeah. So a lot of the, the law school sort of prototype is the history poli sci undergrad, or maybe they did some sort of pre-law route. But uh, honestly, thinking about it, I wonder, do you, do you did you feel like your uh, experience in sort of brain sciences and thinking about how people think and thinking about how people think about logic, did that give you an advantage? Because frank, frankly, I don't really think that the political science or history track uh, necessarily sets <laughs> you up to be super proficient at the law necessarily. <laughs> I would like to think that. I guess since I didn't go the the poli sci or history route, I, I it's hard to compare. But mm -hmm. um, but I do think 
you know, having having some semblance of how logic works helps a lot in law school. And I think one way to look at that is people that go into law school with, for example, like STEM backgrounds, I think also do well because of that same reasoning, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're used to and good at, at um, you know, if-then scenarios and kind of thinking mm-hmm. through, um, you know, piece by piece of this puzzle, if this happens, then then what does that result from you know legal basis, kind of applying that algorithm methodology of thinking. Well, how did um, you enjoy law school then? I and I actually really loved it. You know, minus the the workload. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I can't say you know obviously like, it wasn't it wasn't the the most fun, especially with one L year when when you get kind of thrown into the thick of it. Yeah, um, it's not quite undergrad. And, and, all, and all the hazing that comes along with it. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. mean the entire one L year, Penel? <laughs> I mean, sort of. I yeah. don't know how it was at your school, but at my school, there was definitely a lot of the professors. Some of oh, them yeah, no. very much enjoyed that that power. <laughs> I, I, I will go on record multiple times saying I think that the one L year is ninety eight percent hazing and two percent yeah, just totally trying to not hate everyone around you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the so, cold calling. And, oh, go ahead. I, no, the I, think, I, I, I don't want to pontificate how much I hated law school, but. I do think it's curious. So you thought you were going to be an immigration attorney. How did you get this tech calling? Because I always I find people's just how looking into tech policy tends to be interesting for folks. Yeah, definitely. So so when I was in law school, I I honestly didn't get involved in the tech space very much. Like I, you know, I learned obviously some of the, the basic classes like IP law and things like that, but. Um, but yeah, my my interest really came from so basically after law school, I I clerked for a judge, and and so this is part of my kind of path thinking I was going to go down this litigation track, and and I worked on a couple of privacy related cases, um, for example, there was a, a case related to cell phone searches in the criminal context and what that means from a privacy standpoint, and that was happening on. The national level as well, not just where I was. So, so working on that case, I was thinking a lot about what that means from the from a very human side of like, okay, you have your person, and you have your cell phone, and maybe at some point this is just a device that you use to facilitate your life, but it's somehow become this extent, um, I guess, extension of your person. And so, what does that mean, both legally, but also just um, more from a philosophical standpoint of of how we live our lives, right? Um, so I just found that really fascinating, and so so I started learning a lot more about privacy after that, and and I really just loved how kind of going back to some of these themes that I mentioned before of how privacy law really has this component of of humanness to it, and and what it really means of how you're living your life and how you should be living your life, and. And and now, I think in the last five to ten years, there's been this explosion of legislation on the on the privacy law uh, side of things internationally. And so, how how do we live our lives with that added component, right? Whether it's in a business context or in a personal context. Mm-hmm. Um, so to answer your question, how I kind of found myself in tech after that, with my with my interest in privacy, I actually. After clerking, I decided that I didn't want to do litigation for a number of reasons, and um, and I actually decided to go into privacy consulting for a little bit, uh, and so I got to work with lots of different clients. So I like working in a law firm, but working with lots of different clients to help them figure out their privacy needs for their for their companies, and and I really enjoyed it. And so, how and was so that worked... process like? I, I know that a, a lot of our listeners are early career professionals, or maybe they are going to be getting out of school shortly. And the idea of consulting certainly seems appealing to a lot of people. But what was what was that process like going from clerking to suddenly saying, okay, I'm going to be offering my services as a consultant and getting customers and getting or getting clients. And, you know, what was that like? Yeah, it was I mean, it's definitely different. Like I, so I mentioned I had essentially been on that litigation track during law school. And then post law school clerking and so so going f- from spending a lot of time researching and r- writing briefs and memos and making things very kind of academic to 
learning how to make things a lot more practical and uh, accessible. So for example, if I'm working with a client who, you know, is, is not very mature from a privacy standpoint, like they don't have a privacy team, or maybe they just have like one privacy council and they're trying to get their company up to speed on, on their privacy practices, then learning to, to talk about privacy from more of a layman standpoint mm-hmm. as opposed to like an academic or scholarly uh, perspective. And then also finding practical ways to actually implement that, not just talk about it as if you're some smart person and that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. such an important skill because I think that we don't learn that enough in law school. It's like how to translate that into the real world. And like you said, most people don't want to want to hear and don't understand legally they just want to know what are the real world implications for what you're telling me what was it like finding clients how how was that how was the process i mean as an early career professional i feel like it's really difficult to come into a business and be like look i know that i'm you know 20 something but i I promise you i've got the expertise that you need (laughs) well so i was i was working for a company and so you know the higher level people well the company took care of that piece so, so that was something I didn't have to worry about, which I, I agree with that would be really difficult to do being an early career professional, and, and lots of people do do it. Um, I, I will say that because there is such a demand for this work right now, I, I think that there are a lot of early career professionals, even if you were going on on your own to do this, like, mm-hmm. that if you can just find a way to demonstrate your credibility and your competence, that that you would be able to to find clients to be able to do that work with. Mm-hmm. Do you have and any... you have your your certified information, what is it, certified information privacy professional license. Um, and so did Not you have license. that already? <laughs> Not a license. It's a certificate. Sorry. Um, did you already have that at that point? Or was it something that like, did that help you kind of sell yourself? Or was it something you got after the fact? I, so I got that certification after I moved here. So during during that privacy consulting job, uh, I I think from and a lot of people ask me, you know, is is that something that I should get if I'm interested in privacy or that I want to kind of establish myself as a privacy expert in some way? I think that if you're either new to privacy or early on in your career, it's good to have just if nothing else, it's kind of a badge to say that you know some mm-hmm. of the basics. Uh, I don't think that you know if you have privacy experience that it necessarily helps you. I I think that the certification, honestly, is like it's not a rigorous bar exam type certification, right? It's it's, and I don't know if you, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it as well. Mm-hmm. Studying so, for it now, been putting it off for too long, but need to take it. Yes. <laughs> Preach. Why are you studying? Take the practice exam. If you do okay on the practice <laughs> exam, just get it over with. I know. I don't know what I'm. I like. I have a California bar license. I don't know why I'm like freaking out about it. <laughs> no, literally. I mean. I'll tell you right now. So when I studied for it, like, and when I say study, I mean quote unquote studied. <laughs> I right. I studied for like maybe a couple hours after work every day for like a week or two. Oh wow! Um, and most of that was just like practice questions and kind of right. skimming through the material, and and then I took the exam and and that was it. <laughs> All right. So Good to know. I, I don't want to hi- I don't want to hijack the conversation because I could actually talk about privacy, privacy compliance forever, as <laughs> my co-hosts know. Um, but I, I do sort of think it's fascinating. So you're on the show today to talk about um, blockchain, um, the fact that you've been in-house doing some like fintech work. So how do you move from being doing privacy stuff to getting interested in all of this other stuff, I guess, is my question. I mean, blockchain yeah. is sexy, guys. It's sexy. So <laughs> I, I, can, I can see why you're drawn to it. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess a couple things there. Uh, so my previous role, um, I worked at a company called Tipalti, which is basically a, a B2B payments global company. And so they didn't necessarily work in blockchain, uh, but because so much of the work was dealing with payments and international transactions, there, right. there were some of these discussions were happening at work and with the banks that we partnered with in that role. Um, and so, so my interest kind of stemmed a little bit from that. Um, certainly there was hype about it from a law policy technology standpoint. So I was curious to see what it was about. Um, and then kind of in tandem with that, I do a lot of work with commercial transactions. And so I was really 
interested in the smart contracts piece of it and learning about how that could have potential with the kind of work that I do. For example, if um, you know if there's ways that that makes commercial transactions more efficient or easier to do or more secure, um, you know, just learning more about the potential of that and and how maybe in the future that could apply to the work that I do. Anisha, do you want to do the honors of talking about uh, the foundations of blockchain or what we're really talking about when we say blockchain and cryptocurrencies? Yeah, definitely. I can I can get that started. So um, just to just to kind of cushion this a little bit, I think most people, and this myself included, don't don't fully understand blockchain to the point that an expert really could, and that's because you really need to need to essentially be able to understand the very technical piece of it. For example, be a developer and then understand how that works in the context of blockchain. Um, and so that's actually one of my personal goals is to to learn more about the coding piece of um, piece of this, not just from a blockchain standpoint, but I think that makes you a better lawyer if you're working in tech to be able to understand Absolutely. that. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so to, to kind of um, counter or even agree with what you both are saying about, you know, have this passion for it, but also maybe not necessarily fully understanding it. I think, I think it's easy to kind of jump on the hype about it when there's so much media coverage and so much discussion about it, especially in the tech space. Um, I, I personally, maybe this is me having a lawyer back legal background, but I, I like to kind of learn about both sides of things. And so I think, um, you know, just to, just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying, I, I definitely have friends that are all about it and the rest of us get annoyed sometimes because we're like, okay, can you please stop talking about this? Like nobody knows what you're talking about or we're just sick of hearing about it. Um, <laughs> um, but, but that said, I think it has some really some really cool use cases, and so so to answer your question, like what is blockchain, right? So, yes, so from what a high level, so so blockchain is you know an open distributed ledger. Ideally, it can record transactions between multiple parties efficiently and in, in a permanent, verifiable way. And there's a lot of controversy kind of embedded in some of that some of those promises and, and those definitions. But ultimately, the reason that that people are thinking that this is a revolutionary concept is there's no middleman or overseer of this technology. So like, just for comparison, let's say you're making a payment through like a bank, right, to your friend or through Venmo or something. Um, Venmo or the bank or multiple parties that are financial institutions are kind of overseeing that process. Over here, there's there's no kind of one arbiter or one overseer of this process. Um, and so as a result, people are thinking, okay, this could potentially be faster than those types of transactions. I don't think they are right now, but the, there's a potential for them to be in the future. Um, and then there's also, some people are arguing that this is, will be more secure um, and that's there's a few reasons for that as well I think there's some controversy about the security standpoint as well but um, right. yeah I wanted yeah, to ask you about the security issue you know since we talk about cyber security all the time we talk about cyber hygiene which is as important as brushing your teeth um, and so here you know you have a decentralized system that's sort of the basis of blockchain right so with the centralized system you have that single point of failure where you have numerous issues with reliability, accessibility, et cetera. So does a decentralized system solve these security issues? I would say yes and no. So, I mean, so I think this is a controversial point for a lot of people, and I think it depends on what piece of it you're talking about. So basically blockchain uses a combination of kind of public and private keys to mm -hmm. to allow people to enter in, into these transactions and so um just kind of stepping back for a second when when you when I, and i say you as a, as if i've done it before but <laughs> but when you when you kind of enter into a transaction based on based on blockchain that's happening pseudonymously in in the sense of 
and I can't say that word properly this morning for some reason, no but, can. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but essentially that means that, you know, your name and whatever you're, you're not identified publicly as mm-hmm. part of that transaction when you're making it. And so, um, which I guess that's more of kind of the privacy side of it, but, but I think what, what's happening is that, that people, I think it's not at a point where people can, cannot, um, cannot hack into it. And I'm not explaining this well, but, um, I like to think that it offloads the responsibility to the users, but that the systems are not developed enough to make it easy enough that the users aren't going to fuck it up themselves, frankly. Yeah, I think like every public private key pair. It's like PGP is super secure, you know, nothing's nothing's hacked PGP, but you're going to mess up signing. You're going to mess up, you know, you're going to lose your private key. And in that case, it's hackable. And that's Mm -hmm. what's happened with every major, well, not all of them, but most of the major cryptocurrency like hacks that get it talk right. about in the news right, yeah which... well and the other piece of it is it's immutable right like it's like you can't go back and like change what you did so so let's say there is a mistake made how do you go back and fix that right Ooh, that's a good point um yeah so i think i think you know people and so that i think is part of the reason why people say okay it is really secure because you can't go in and, and make these changes willy-nilly but um, but then that also kind of, uh, kind of like Emery just mentioned, I think that can also create some of the problems as well. So, so maybe the, the challenge is that, well, it might be technically secure. Um, it doesn't offer the type of security that I think the average user or av- general public would trust. Um, I, I guess that's when my thinking when I look at blockchain and all of the many, many applications for it that all sound very, very exciting um, but in general, just this notion that you're going to have this decentralized world that doesn't have that's not um, operated by any given authority, nobody trusts it. So then we start like glomming on other folks back onto that. Is that is that an accurate assessment? Well, that's, or? I think that's interesting because the the whole premise of the blockchain, like the word trustless, is used over and over and over again because that's the <laughs> whole, the whole idea is to create a trustless, immutable ledger, where the the system itself provides the the trust where you can be sure that because f- for example the the code that bl- bitcoin runs on is the are the rules that govern every single transaction and those as those rather as the so for each cryptocurrency transaction they're checked by the overall network at large okay and so you might hear of the word mining that's the process of verifying transactions but also incrementally minting new coins well those the rules that those miners are following are all the same and in order to change those rules you'd have to be able to change more than 50 percent of all the people that are mining right now and so in that way it sort of provides you can trust that the system is going to be going as as intended because otherwise you'd have to co-opt 50 percent of the mining pool but you're totally right joe that i think the general public misses doesn't understand that and and instead um, is used to the idea that you can place your trust in these trusted middlemen which are how all of our transactions are done right now where if you don't like if something goes wrong there's a person you can point to and say okay well it's your fault and Mm -hmm. here's a you know police state or here's the police that i can pull in and force you to conform but otherwise this is probably getting far far afield but isn't it easy i I guess i just in my mind it seems like why is it that difficult to co-op 51% of these miners? I mean, A, my understanding <laughs> is most of the folks are, you know, it's just giant server farms in China. So it's a giant ecosystem that could be controlled by Chinese government. Um, and then, you know, this gets to a larger question about how other blockchains will work. Like when we talk about cryptocurrencies, the incentive is the mining, right? You're going to every periodically you're mining for new Bitcoins, but it's a, that's a finite currency. And once that's gone, I, no one has ever sort of explained to me what is going to be the incentive to keep these systems in place. They take up, a t- they require a ton of energy, lots of computing power. Well, um, you, you just answered and, the first part of your question. The computing power is why it's impossible to, or why it's more difficult to co-opt fifty percent. Anisha, do you want to take the twenty-one million cap question? What happens when twenty-one million bitcoins are mined? What? Why would people continue to mine bitcoins after the twenty-one millionth? 
I mean, I think that's up for debate. Um, I, I would say that, frankly, I kind of asked that question myself, like, why, why would you continue doing it, right? Um, I, I know that, it, like, for blockchain, it's ideally something that kind of feeds on itself so that the more people that are using it, the more, um, so, you know, the, the money that gets involved in it. And so, um, supposedly, it kind of self propels itself in that way but but i kind of question the the ongoing piece of that as well i think that the it's an unsolved answer as well the 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 answer that i've always heard is that so right now if you're mining bitcoin you're not paid exclusively in minted coins because it's so difficult to mine a coin you're mining with a pool of other people and so eventually you may eventually hit if you're lucky hit on a Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is then distributed to all of the miners. But generally you're paid with transaction fees. And so with every single transaction, a if I was to send a Bitcoin to you, for example, Joe, I would have to set how high I want that transaction fee. And that transaction fee goes directly to the miners. Understood. But then doesn't that, isn't that then adding in other third parties and other trusted intermediaries that play a role in the system? Well, it's offloading. I mean, arguably, yeah. Yeah, arguably, <laughs> certainly. And, yeah. And, and so, okay, so doesn't that undermine the entire goal of what we're trying to do here? And, and then I understand it in terms of the incentives of when we're doing dollars and cents, but isn't the big appeal of blockchain is its ability to do all of these wonderful use cases in healthcare and <laughs> um, just I, 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 as, a, as a privacy person, there's privacy settings, but then also you've got the advertisers that seem to think that blockchain is going to be some way um, to verify all of the, the, the ad clicking that's going on in the ad online advertising ecosystem. And I just, I, I don't understand the incentives. And it's not, it's not because I'm <laughs> skeptical. It's just because I, I honestly do not understand what's going on here. Look, when Nestle adds blockchain to their name and you know, their <laughs> stock shoots up, that doesn't mean that blockchain is good for Nestle. There's tons of crap out there. Don't get me wrong. Like, there's a ridiculous amount of hype. There's someone I followed on the internet that is investing in Dentacoin, which is a cryptocurrency designed to disrupt the dental industry. Like, it is rife with <laughs> scams out there. But the underlying technology yeah. does have certain specific use cases. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think there's, I think because of this hype, so many individuals and companies are just kind of signing on to it without really a clear basis. I mean, I'm sure you heard of the, the Kodak scenario as well, where where they decided, okay, we're going to make, you know, photos available based on, based on uh, blockchain chain technology and I remember what reading that. What does that mean? Thinking, it doesn't mean exactly, anything. Like, it doesn't know. mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. A blockchain without a it's cryptocurrency just... is not a blockchain. It's just a database. <laughs> and so, like, it, it's just a, they took the name and put it on their thing, and now everyone thinks that blockchain is stupid because Kodak invested. It's oh. <laughs> well, and and I can't help but think for a lot of people nowadays because it's such a hot button topic that people don't clearly understand. It's all also just a way to get VC money, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. literally yeah. I was talking to somebody not very, you know, maybe a week ago and, and they were like, oh, we, you know, we wanted to start like a hackathon for that integrates like healthcare and blockchain. And I was like, how did I, like, what is the correlation there? I'm not really following. Or maybe there was, I just, you know, I'd like to kind of learn more about that. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then eventually after some back and forth, he was like, yeah, it's really just a way to, to you know, have a higher like of like getting money for it. <laughs> so, how, you're interested in these issues. How how do you, how would you recommend someone like me get up to speed on everything? Like, what who are you talking to? What are you reading? What what's the good stuff in this space? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I we touched upon this a little bit, but I think for very introductory. Uh, you know, reading, for example, I think, so there's a couple people that are kind of the, the pioneers of all this. There's somebody named Nick Sabos, who um, in the 90s, he, he kind of started this movement and, and wrote a, um, wrote about this. And there's also Santoshi, who did a white paper, I think it was in 2008, he released yeah. that one. And that that was actually really nice because it's very concise and it really just gets to the heart of, hey, like, what is this? And even the, the 
technical piece of it. If you're a lawyer, uh, I definitely recommend Nick Sabos, uh, the papers, Formalizing and Securing Relationships Over Public Networks. It will give you just a real – you read it and you understand why people – why a lot of people think that Nick was Satoshi. And you're like, oh, this is very, <laughs> very similar to what we have 10 yeah, years later. Definitely. And just to give you a little background, like um, – Part of what makes this interesting a little bit is there's a little bit of a kind of conspiracy theory in, in the sense that, for example, th this person, Santoshi, nobody actually knows, like, who mm -hmm. he or she is. <laughs> uh, you know, there's... or if... Well, no, apparently he exists, but he denies being the creator. No, it's they don't know who he is. <laughs> I don't think they know who he is. I think it's, it's just this name or this person who is either anonymous or, you know, obviously, maybe it isn't even a group of people that just kind of gave themselves this name. Um, nobody actually knows. But um, the, the article I read was wrong because it was like, he, he, he it's this, this guy who like lives down the street from this other guy who like, <laughs> anyways, I, I'm not going to get into it. Yeah, Newsweek, uh, <laughs> Never mind. Newsweek Newsweek Newsweek. definitely jumped the shark on that one. Uh, there was a no, lot of... I, I... I'm going to echo there's – a, there's a Netflix documentary where they're like pounding the pavement to try and find persons and evidently there is someone by that name close to one of the potential people. That That's what I'm think. saying. That's what yeah. I'm saying. All right. Yeah. All right. Satoshi is like a, a, a common, common student – like pseudonym. It's it's like John Smith. So, yeah. And then there was, of course, yeah. a scammer, Craig Wright, who, who tried – who made an elaborate oh, – yeah. Uh, right about that. illegal proof <laughs> or not illegal but you know fraudulent proof that he was satoshi using some fairly sophisticated key cloning stuff but yeah we don't know who he is so can we talk a little bit about like smart contracts as i know that you um work a little bit in that space and um know a lot about that i think there's really big i mean it's kind of we, we're kind of sound we're talking about blockchain like in, in super hypotheticals and, and as we should be and like the potential of it is very much untapped and unknown um but I feel like the idea, like as it relates to like the sharing economy, for example, the fact that you can, you know, potentially remove the intermediary from any transaction, as we talked about, it's pretty revolutionary. So like a lot of people who work in the gig economy, like Uber and Lyft drivers, to be able to like remove, you know, the their platform that they work for, because like, you know, they're the ones who own the assets and they're the ones who are doing the labor. Um, you know, it's how does I, it sounds like it, it sounds like great. I mean, it, how do we how do we tap into that? Is that something we should like look into? Is it something we should be worried about? Is it feasible? Yeah, I mean, I think the potential is there. And I know we there's a lot of talk of the potential <laughs> uh, about blockchain and smart contracts. Um, I mean, so just to step back for a second, like what what is a smart contract? Right. So, um, I mean, it's basically computer code that's capable of facilitating and executing something, right? Some action, at kind of its very basic form. So, um, so just for example, you know, you mentioned um, Uber and Lyft. I think, I think within that, there's a lot of smaller transactions and executions of actions that would need to happen for that to actually play out. Mm -hmm. Right. So so that could be the actual payment piece of it. That could be the the, you know, ordering of the Lyft or the Uber, you know, from either end. That could be the actual um, the the placement for for where the driver is, where they're being kind of shuttled out to. Like right now, all of that Uber or Lyft is kind of governing all of that. Mm -hmm. So to make to make that all decentralized where where nobody's actually governing all of that um it would just take a lot of interplay between these different transactions so so kind of to, to step back for a second so a smart contract like i said um it's basically it's it's code right and it's execute it's self executable meaning that you don't need a, a person to to make it happen um like if you take a normal contract, right? Right? Like that. Like if I contract with you for whatever reason, like we sign it, we we're the ones who say, okay, um, I'm agreeing to you know buy this car from you, and then I'm gonna make the payment for this, and then you're gonna give me the car, right? In the smart contract mm -hmm. setting, that would all happen without either of us having to actually take these actions. Um, I think there's a really so, great example. If you look at, um, again, 
uh, Nick Sabos talked about a, uh, a coin-operated candy machine at your grocery store. You can think of that as a smart contract in that it's essentially offering the terms of the contract. You give me 25 cents, I will give you a gumball. And by you putting the coin and turning a crank, that crank is a mechanical um, – it, it, that, mechan- that mechanical crank enshrines the terms of that contract in such a way that by turning the crank, you are uh, manifesting your assent to the terms, and the terms of the contract are carried out and executed without any trusted third party. To take like the, the car lease example, yeah, it's like if you, if you take that then to the example that Anisha was just talking about, the, car, it, the contract code could be running on the car, could be running elsewhere, but the contract recognizes when... You make the transaction to pay, then the legal uh, the legal ownership of the car is automatically transferred over. And so the idea of a smart contract is to enshrine as much as possible the terms of any contract in such a way that the terms are self-executing and it's either difficult or maybe impossible to break the contract. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's actually a good example to kind of demonstrate the self-executing part of it. I think the other piece of it that to kind of relate it back to the Uber and Lyft example is that, um, so these, these smart contracts, they're unchangeable, right? They're immutable. And so let's say something happens where, um, you know, a car is, is sent out to pick you up, but then something changes, you know, you want to change your destination. You want to pay in a different method. Mm -hmm. How are you going to change that? How are you going to change that in, you know, in, in this kind of, on or decentralized mode right. where these the smart contract you it's just not changeable right it's, it's sounding more and more like anarchy right now <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about anisha um what do you think is the potential for blockchain like where 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 do you see this leading like where is it going I and mean, with bitcoin it's already like you, there's houses in san francisco that have for sale signs that say bitcoin accepted which blows my mind. Um, so, you know, it, it, some people say it's going to all fall apart and some people say, no, it's, it's actually like we can build something off of this. And obviously blockchain is bigger than just Bitcoin. So like, what do you see as the potential for all of this? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a couple of things. So blockchain generally, especially from like a Bitcoin standpoint, I think it's really hard to say. Obviously, there's been more and more adoption. So that's been really cool. But it's also you know, like we just mentioned, there's like a lot of anarchy, right? Like, mm-hmm. like you look at the volatility of of cryptocurrencies right now, whether it's, um, you know, Litecoin or, or whatever. Else. Like, so many, there's so many out there now. But you know, one day it's it's at three dollars, next day it's at ten cents. Like, I don't, I just don't see how without some more stability in that in that um, in that process. People mm-hmm. are going to trust their money with this, <laughs> right? Um, at least, at least from an investment and just kind of general use standpoint. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't make sense. As like, I mean, I know people that you know maybe just for fun just put some money into it just to see what happens, but that's about it. And you know, um, if you read Satoshi's paper, it's like the the idea is you know his paper is peer to peer electronic cash. And yeah. like Bitcoin is so far from being useful as cash today. Like it, it, if you look at the Bitcoin communities, no one is talking about it as a, 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 a digital cash anymore because the transaction fees are huge because it's so you know volatile. And mm-hmm. it's not even really a good store of wealth anymore either because it's so volatile. So I think that the, the whole community is trying to figure out like uh, it's worth something, but can we, what, what are we using this for? Right, exactly. And then I think the other piece of it so like I like I mentioned like I think the smart contract piece of it is interesting but then you know if you try to apply it to for example like in a commercial setting like I do transactions with the other companies um so if I'm if I try to use smart contracts at least the way that it's set up now in in that context I mean it would just be so hard like let's say I my company has a negotiation and then a contract with another company and then six months down the road they want to amend that contract how do we do that right um mm. like with smart contract that is just not right. an option right <laughs> um, or even just the intent piece of it right which is very human and and not not very amenable to just the the coding like let's say you again negotiated this contract and each party has certain intent attributed to the terminology or the kind of actions embedded within that but then mm-hmm. you know 
something happens and it turns out that there was some kind of conflict there, how do you how do you account for that? Right. Um, so are you guys working with smart contracts at all? Like on the, you know, actually dealing with actual smart contracts right now or is it mostly theory? No, it's it's just theory. We're not actually working with smart contracts because it just doesn't right. make sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm curious. So when you, is this is this part of your day job or is this a hobby when you're not doing Bollywood fusion dance? <laughs> I would characterize it as more of a hobby. I, so in my, in my current job, so I work in house at a company called Zendesk, which is basically a, a B2B company. It's, it's a SaaS platform that is, does customer engagement for other companies. Um, so in, in my role, like I said, I do a lot of commercial transactions as well as privacy work. And so kind of in tandem with that, this is more of a side interest. Um, but I have been following it just to see if there's any potential application. For example, if we could do our, our contracts and negotiations in a more efficient way and this has the potential applications, then that would be awesome because <laughs> um, we spend a lot of time on that stuff. And your result of is this – Five years from now, ten years from now, is you mean result in terms of when it could potentially be? Yeah, uh, sure. that's. I mean, the way it stands right now, I think it's a long ways out. <laughs> um, this, the 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 types of smart contracts that are executable right now are just so simple, um, and the transactions that I deal with are so complex that I think there's a lot of kind of development and improvement needed to be able to apply it to what what happens in a commercial setting. Um, but that said, I, I, you know, it's definitely not impossible. Does Zendesk um, deal with any sort of licensing of IP? I know that's one of the areas that I think is most immediately actionable with smart contracts today. Yeah, no, we, there is some of that. Although because it's, it's a SaaS platform, it's really just um, – it's we don't do as much with the licensing. It's a little more like – I, I guess in the licensing, in the sense of like, hey, we're giving you this license to use our product, mm-hmm. um, but not so much from like a software standpoint. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, Anisha, we uh, we like to ask all of our guests what they're reading right now. Um, what's on your nightstand? You know, and if you're not reading a book, what podcast are you listening to? Hint, hint. Tech policy grind or <laughs> anything else that you're just kind of involved with on the side, other than Bollywood fusion dance. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. So, um, I'm actually reading Fahrenheit 451 right now. Oh. Um, it was, I know it's one of those books that a lot of people read in like high school and, and talk about it in class, and I just never did that. And so, I was kind of curious. Um, and I'm actually pleasantly surprised by how thought provoking it is in the sense that it kind of has a lot of themes with like literacy, effects of you know, spending a lot of time with technology and screen time, you know, independent thinking, access to information. Um, I'm, I've actually been really enjoying it. This has been an episode of Tech Policy Grind, a podcast from Internet Law and Policy Foundry. We're a collection of tech law and policy professionals working in privacy, cybersecurity, and obviously way too much blockchain. If you like what you just heard, it would be a huge help if you'd head over to iTunes or your podcasting platform of choice and leave a rating or give us a review. Um, You can follow us on Twitter at Tech Policy Grind. And please look forward to new episodes, generally twice a month, on Mondays. Thanks to Ali Sternberg, as ever, for the music, and until next time, keep grinding. (laughs) 